Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Hi there and welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. Glad you could join us today. Now I just want to start by saying Happy New Year. (laughs) I know it was a few weeks back but I hope you've had a good start to the year and I wish you all the best for 2019. Now I'm really excited to be sharing this episode with you today for a number of reasons. Uh, I think it's very timely considering that this is the time of the year where we make New Year's resolutions, we reflect on where we are and what we want to achieve Uh, Perhaps you've already set some goals and started achieving some of those or maybe broken some of them. Um, But in this episode, we're going to be talking about what it takes to be the best or perhaps I should say what it takes to be your best. Now, we're going to be talking about high performance trading, what it takes to have a successful trading career over the long term. And joining us for this chat is one of the best, Linda Rashke. Now, I'm sure you know Already that Linda has experienced a very high level of trading success throughout her career. And, um, you know, there really aren't too many traders around the world who can say that they've achieved the level of performance, success and longevity that Linda has. So she's really an excellent person to discuss this with us today. Um, Linda's going to share some stories with us and some really valuable trading wisdom, which I'm sure uh, you're going to enjoy. So let's jump straight into my chat now with Linda. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the show. It's really great to have you here again. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me back. I think this is the third time actually you've been on the podcast. So we all feel very honored to have you here. And, um, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Um, now, firstly, I just wanted to start off by saying congratulations to you on the release of your new book. Uh, it's called Trading Sardines, Lessons in the Market from a Lifelong Trader. And I know that you've put a lot of time and effort into that book, and um, it's a really fantastic book, actually. Do you want to share a little bit at a high level about, um, you know, what the book is about? Oh, my goodness. Um, (laughs) You know, if if somebody wants to go and, like, read the first chapter, they can just go to my website, Linda Rashke, and you can just click on the little banner and uh, and then you could read the first chapter and see all the table of contents. But in a nutshell, it's uh, I looked back at my trading career so far because it's not over yet. And it's like 38 years. And I'm thinking, how did I manage to be on the outside of almost every fiasco on the wrong side of it? You know, I mean, it's like really like beyond random. And then it wasn't just bad events, you know, like being on the wrong side of ugly gaps that nobody could see coming, you know, it was everything else like getting smacked by two hurricanes and, you know, having my, my, you know, world trade center. I used to do business one block from there. So that was a a fiasco. I mean, MF global, I mean, every major story except for Madoff, you know, in this business, I seem to have my like feet mucked up by And so it was sort of like a little humorous thing like that because people always like to pound on their chest and brag about their good trades, you know? (laughs) I'm like, I I got a few doozies, you know, that like, you know, I think so. And then in the process of writing that, and and the book is really quite humorous, um, you start to figure out, well, how was it that I was able to overcome that challenge? Or how was it I was able to make back that horrific loss? You know, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm sure that I'm not the first to say that my best trades have always been making back losers, you know. And uh, so, um, it, it, then, and then as more things came to light, I'm like, wow, I really learned a lot from different people all along the road. You know, people were generous with their time or I had market learning experiences or, you know, through the market technicians association or uh, wonderful, wonderful people to work with. You know, uh, Nigel did all my modeling quantitative stuff and I would not have been able to accomplish a lot of the things that I did without some of these amazing people around me. And uh, so 
so I share I share a lot of the little things that I learned from them too. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things that really stood out to me in the book um, was, uh, well, obviously you've had a very successful trading career so far over a really long time. And, you know, there aren't really too many traders around that have done that. So you're in a very elite group. But I think sometimes um, uh, people see the success without really understanding all the things that happened to get there. And in your book, you're very open about some of the challenges that you've had to face, especially as you mentioned with market outliers. And it definitely seems like you got more than your fair share. Do you think perhaps maybe you're an unlucky person or is there... <laughs> Me, <laughs> or is there... struck by lightning three times. <laughs> yes, I'm in the world of beginnings record book. Yes. <laughs> well, wow. I guess many uh, traders like to think in terms of um, you know, probability and statistical models and normal distributions, but you know, reading through your book, it really stands out about the number of outliers that really do occur and you know the type of stuff that can wipe a trader out and send them home. Do you think maybe perhaps there's an underappreciation of how crazy things can get and how often it actually happens? Um. Yeah, because we're human and we don't know how to think about those things because they don't happen very often. You know, our brains can process stuff that we see repeatedly in patterns. And so that's where we feel most comfortable with. Now, I think from an academic perspective, I would say that everybody out there is pretty well educated to the fact that um, – this concept of fat tails, obviously, um, Nassim Talib made it very popular, you know, the black swan stuff, and that the market uh, price behavior does not follow a, a standard distribution bell shaped curve type of thing. So, um, however, just understanding that can be very abstract, and we don't really put it into our lives. And, um, you know, and, and part of the book process, you know, I, I got to read a lot of other books and really think about some of these things. And one of the books that, that was excellent was called The Improbability Principle, Why Coincidences, Miracles, and Rare Events Happen Every Day. And that's by David Hand. So anybody can Google Improbability um, Principle, David Hand, and he now works for Winton. So, you know, he went from being a mathematician and professor to going and working for one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Um, and in that book, he really shows why we get things wrong, you know, why we tend to underestimate these fat tails and how it might seem like it's a coincidence that you got hit by lightning two times. But if you really understand the math and there's this many people and this many lightning strikes and so forth, then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I never thought about that. That's really probable. You know, why is it that you have these cases of people in the United States and a couple might have won a lottery ticket twice? You know, you'd say like, oh, that's that's impossible, you know, but it happens. And he explains the math and, and some of these theories why. And uh, it was a really, really interesting read. Um, I would recommend it to anybody just to open your mind, uh, you know, into all the different possibilities out there. Mm -hmm. But what about the role of luck, though? Because we have, um, you know, got very smart people looking at the markets and, um, uh, you know, a lot of these smart traders can't see when these outliers uh, uh, are going to occur. So do you think luck perhaps plays a bigger role in trading results than brains or, or more than we'd like to credit it? <laughs> Well, there's two threads on that. Of course, there's the old adage that luck is a residue of effort, right? So if you have good luck, it's because you've been doing your homework and preparation and you're there to capitalize on it when it does come. Um, in terms of the bad luck, um, that falls back into the camp of it might seem like I'm on the wrong side of every freaking outlier. <laughs> but, you know, if I looked at the raw numbers and said, okay, I made 50,000 trades over the last, you know, 38 years, and 10 of those were like being on the wrong side of a horrific gap. It's just that, you know, all of a sudden those gaps are very memorable because they make a big dent to your bottom line. Then you do the math and the real numbers, and it's like, you know, it's within the realm of reality there that this stuff happens. It's just very impressionable upon a blonde, you know. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> now that's interesting the the way you you kind of reframe that if you think about it in in a, a larger perspective I, I guess it does kind of make sense but you know some people um have um, blown up because of these outliers um now obviously you've been in the markets for so long i'm sure you've seen quite a few people come and go um but the reason it- people blow up from outliers is because they don't understand leverage and they are using mm. way more leverage than they should or they have on too big of a position and that's like long term capital management you know they didn't have to blow up if they were much smaller they actually could have ridden out that spike but uh they were just way too big so do you think that uh, understanding of leverage was one of the the key factors that has enabled you to stay in the game for so long or is there other things there that Yeah, can- yeah, I mean you just don't get so so big. I mean it's really uh you know, kind of comes down to that. Mm, yeah. Now I've heard you mention before that um uh, confidence is really important in trading. Uh, you've said you need to have confidence in yourself, confidence in your models, but there are times when the market can suck that confidence right out of you, especially in outliers and things like that. So how do you go about regaining the confidence after you've um, you've experienced something like that? Well, I think that you have to have a very strong sense of confidence you know, throughout your life, you find a lot of people that are successful in the markets have been successful in other endeavors, be it sports or poker or, you know, golf or some other endeavor. And they're able to transfer that innate confidence to whatever they're doing, not just the markets. And, um, it's funny. I'll, I'll just, if you've got time for me to elaborate, I've had this trading book for, it's, it's a notebook for like years. And in it, I have my pages where I log all my numbers and stuff. And on the outside, there's these little, uh, slip cover that I can put some thoughts in there. And I've had Mm -hmm. these three excerpts, uh, for probably 25 years that stare at me every day when I sit down at my desk. Um, one of them, the first one is by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's an excerpt from his book, The Education of a Bodybuilder. Um, I sort of, uh, idolized his work ethic that Arnold had to get to where he got. And in it, he says, I'll just read this quote. The secret is contained in a three-part formula I learned in the gym. Self-confidence, a positive mental attitude, and honest hard work. Many people are aware of these principles, but very few can put them into practice. Particularly that last. When I was writing Pumping Iron, I asked Arnold what single characteristic most contributed to his phenomenal ongoing domination of bodybuilding. He said, I work harder at it. I wish I could imitate his accent, you know, but I can't. (laughs) Well, I work harder at it. You know, the others think they work hard, but they don't really push themselves to their limits. Mm. So I do think that the harder that you work is going to contribute to your confidence. And then I have another one that is from this series of little things that would get sent me every day years ago. And it says, preparation is the secret to confidence. There can be no great courage when there is no confidence or assurance. Half the battle is in the conviction that you can accomplish what you undertake. With practice, Mm. you'll come to a point of competence. You'll find yourself accomplishing your goals with grace and confidence. It's then that you'll do things that you never dreamed you could do. You'll discover powers you never knew existed. And if you're prepared, you're able to feel confident. Confidence doesn't come out of nowhere. It's the result of constant work and dedication. Mm. So, I mean, I think that says it all. I I can't uh, say anything that would expand on that better than those words. Yeah. And when you were mentioning that work ethic then, you reminded me about a conversation we had um, last year when you were here in Melbourne. Okay. Um, You were here presenting at the ATAA conference and um, we were out for dinner and you mentioned something to me that that really uh, kind of inspired me. I don't know if you recall it, but we were talking about um, what makes traders successful and um, what you said really made me assess my dedication and focus to trading at the time because I think as um, as humans, we can sometimes take on too many things at once or uh, we can easily get distracted by other things or you know there are things that happen in life that are outside of our control. And sometimes we don't realize that we're in this state where we're trying to do so many things 
and we never really um, do anything well. So I I know um, you know this is kind of an obvious question, but I think it's some sometimes we need to hear this stuff about um, you know traders underestimating what's involved. Um, can you give us some insights into how you've actually approach trading in regards to um, work ethic, dedication and focus? You know, it's funny because you asked like, well, what is responsible for my longevity in the business? And it's never been a job to me. I don't even think of it as work. I mm. I love it. So it's more of a lifestyle, you know, and I've I'd choose to sit in front of the screens than to have a girlfriend to go shopping with. You know, it's uh, every, all my people I know and the contacts I know, everybody is in the market one way or another, other than the barn where I keep my horse and, you know, some people there that keep me grounded. And then, you know, over at the gym, but other than the gym and the barn, you know, everything is, is the markets and I love it. I want it that way. You know, I like traveling to Australia and being able to present. I like talking to, you know, people on the other side of the world. I, I like not talking. I like just watching the charts and trading, you know. So, um, and I get frustrated like everybody else. It doesn't mean like it's all like playing a great video game and you're winning all the time. Um, but so, it, you know, I enjoy it. It's a it's a constant puzzle. I'm always thinking up like new little tweaks or ways of looking at things. And just like I was talking about earlier with you, modeling context, you know, some of the tricky gray variables that you get in trying to model context uh, and how important that can be if you are a a systematic algorithmic type of trader. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it's a tremendous amount of hours. I remember just weekends just sitting and, you know, grinding out research. And then it's not just the research or the markets. It's it's the mental stuff too, you know. I have little quartz crystals and magic light bulbs and, <laughs> you know, all these little things, you know. that and I, and I take special vitamins and eat a certain way and make sure I exercise at the gym and do all these things so that my brain functions, you know, at all optimal performance and and then of course you can't just do markets you do have to have some balance a way to get your mind off of the markets i think that you really have to recharge those batteries that's a big part of the equation Mm. so there's all these little moving parts and pieces um so it's you know and that take up time and thought and energy and um, you just have to make that choice that that's what you enjoy doing you know as opposed to perhaps taking vacations, <laughs> little things like that. I don't know. You know, I went for 10 years without a dating life. What does that say? You know, <laughs> I got divorced. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the marriage too. Okay. I guess that was suffered, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you said there that you like to spend a lot of time researching the markets and your trading can be a very uh, time consuming endeavor. Uh, but you also mentioned that you you ride your horses, you go to the gym, you've got all this other stuff that you do. Uh, so it can be kind of tricky to balance all this stuff when you're really focusing a lot on your trading. What does your day actually look like? Do you is it like an eighteen hour work day, or do you split it up with a bit of something here and there, or how, how do you? No, actually- I, I get up in the morning. I I, I I let the dogs out. You know, I go sit in front of my screen, turn on the computers, and and you know, look at what all the overnight market action was. And I go back and make coffee for my husband. You know, I gave up coffee as of six days ago. Don't ask me why. <laughs> you know, but because <laughs> it was miserable. You know, withdrawing from caffeine. But I yeah. I do better with my green tea, and. Um, I, you know, I felt like I was getting addicted, like I was drinking five cups in two hours. I'm like, this is not good. It's making my body too acidic. So I had to make that conscious choice to deprive myself of that pleasure, you know, because I really want to be able to think as best I can. And um, I felt like my brain was not you know, it had gotten a little fuzzy, you know, maybe it was those bottles of wine that I was drinking, you know, <laughs> I, I gave up alcohol a couple months too. I've been, I've been dry, you know, and well, you're clean. Yeah. I, I nice. am. And I'm just, you know, now I'm just trying to stay away from sugar, but see, all these things are very conscious decisions geared specifically, um, towards, 
you know, performance in the market. Mm -hmm. And of course, it would be nice if I lost a little weight, you know, that's always a fringe benefit. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, seriously, it's, um, so I get up in the morning, I turn on all this stuff, you know, I used to go to the gym for 40 minutes. I don't do that anymore because so much happens overnight. I just, you know, like to look at it. And then I, uh, I come back and I sit in front of my computer and I, I just try to watch for a little bit. You know, I don't want to just jump in and make trades like mm-hmm. half an hour after I woke up. That's not really good. And then, uh, you know, I have an assistant that comes in, you know, at eight in the morning. So that's, that's great. You know, now we can both sit here in silence. That's good, you know. <laughs> and, uh, Yeah. And, you know, and then I I have my program that I did the day before. So the day just goes, I I try not to think, you know, I try not to scenario build. I don't try, you know, to figure things out. I'm just, it's like watching that tennis ball go back and forth and back and forth. And you're waiting for that one shot that you recognize and you feel, you know, and and you just have the confidence like, yes, this is what I was waiting for. I was waiting for it to test below the previous day's low and find price rejection back down there. And now I'm going to put on that trade, you see? And, and I think that you can only be that way if you've totally eliminated all the distractions and opinions, you know, the Twitter and the blogs and, and other people's thoughts, because only then do I feel it like this is what I was waiting for. And I was trying to visualize what this might look like last night. And now it's falling right into my lap and boom, you can go and convert then. And that's when Mm -hmm. you can put a trade in bigger size, but it really takes a lot of patience and stocking. And so I try not to think about too much. I have like Pandora music, you know, I like playing good, you know, lounge music and electronic music and stuff like that. So then, you know, I, um, I usually about 10 o'clock, we'll go and make myself breakfast, which is either eggs or heating up some oatmeal. And, <laughs> and I bring it back to my desk, you know, so I've got, I've got food prep in two minutes down. I write an encyclopedia volume on, on meals, two minute meals that you can eat at your desk, you know, that might be my next book. And then seriously, at, at lunch, what do I do? I go grab a can of tuna. I really do. A can of tuna or a can of salmon, you know, because mm. I can eat it at my desk, you know. And, and then I do have, uh, it's it's not all serious, you know, I have um, a, a little Skype group of two or three friends I've known for 10 years and uh, it's pretty lewd and crude and hilarious at lunchtime. You know, <laughs> we really don't discuss the market, but you know, we sort of keep e- each other laughing at certain times and you know, that type of stuff. And then at the end of the day, I, um, I log my numbers, I print off my trade sheet, you know, I do my homework and, and then I get out of here and I, you know, the minute I walk out of my office, I don't think about it at all. You know, I go off and ride the horse and then I go to the gym and then come back and and eat dinner and maybe watch a Netflix or something. But then I'm back in the office. You know, I always love being in the office for like Asia openings. That's that's pretty um, good. A lot of times I initiate positions on Asia opening um, because I'm trying to look at the trend for the day and if the trend for the day is going to reverse and and so forth and, you know, try to get to bed at a reasonable hour, I've really been making a concerted effort to get at least seven and a half hours of sleep. That, that makes a big difference. So Mm -hmm. there you go. That's my life. Yeah. So it sounds like then that you, um, take breaks throughout the day and not just be like in front of the screen the whole time. And does that help to refresh your mind a little bit and keep you focused for when you have to No, My break is like going and grabbing a can of tuna fish and bring it back to my desk. (laughs) Like a substantial break there, Andrew. (laughs) And then I drink tea and then I get a break because I have to go to the bathroom and then I make more tea and I sit down and then I have to go to the bathroom. So that's, that's my exercise during the day. I'm serious. That's the break. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask you about motivation um, because you just mentioned before that you, uh, you really love the markets. And um, so I'm just wondering, you know, there are a number of reasons why people want to trade. Some people do it for the money. Some people do it for the intellectual side of trying to figure the markets out like a game. Um, I guess some traders just want a cool story of a 10 bagger they can tell at barbecues. But um, do you think the type of motivation, um, the underlying motivation for training has any bearing on potential success? 
Um, well, you know, it's sad that any um, performance-oriented discipline, be it sports or trading, um, you'll do best, of course, if your motivation is on the process, you know, perfecting your serve and, you know, those types of metrics as opposed to, uh, you know, how many points did you win type of thing. So same thing with trading. For me, I never really looked at the dollar amounts. In fact, that's a lousy way to be motivated. I usually shut them off so I can't see them during the trading day. I don't want to see my P&L during the day. Um, mm. I don't want to see it till the end of the month, quite frankly, you know, (laughs) just tell me at the end of the month that I make money, you know, but um, I'd say that in the beginning, I really felt strongly that I could figure out a way that other people hadn't looked at, you know, I thought that I could see things differently or come up with patterns or just, I just created my own little playing board. Really. It was like my own little game, you know, and I had my own rules to my game and I, I didn't really share them with anybody else or even bother to, to show them to anybody else. It was just sort of me. And, you know, I came from the trading floors and everybody's like mostly in, in the pits, but of course it was options strategies. So as an option market maker, it's not a directional game like the, um, you know, trading in the bond pit or something. It's, it's a lot of arbitrage and different type of strategies, but, um, I was one of the first off the, you know, the options floors to really be aggressive in futures, you know, so I was sort of a crossover. Nobody else on those option floors, and I was on the Pacific Coast Exchange and the Philadelphia Exchange, got into futures quite the way that I did. So I didn't really have any guiding voice out there, you know, which was kind of cool. Like everything I did was just like, oh, let me play with this. Oh, well, let me just like print off, you know, 50 charts and, you know, circle what happened here and there and so forth. And um, that, you know, that was really fun. So I really felt like I could solve something or come up with something you know i i I did a i ran a neural network in like 1993 nobody was doing neural networks in 1993 you know but i had a good friend and his his the friend the son of his best friend was um worked for nasa you know and i got this guy to help me you know do the neural net stuff and train it and all that kind of stuff and i mean i never really used it much for making money a little bit but um it was just the let's let's see where this goes type of thing. And, you know, as you well know, in development and research process, probably 95% of what you develop and investigate gets thrown in the trash, mm-hmm. you know. So you have to enjoy the process. You have to like playing with things, you know, indicators, statistics, um, you know, what's a better way of evaluating something? Should it be a standard deviation function or should it be a, a range price based function or, should, you know, this this type of stuff? And it, it was like this great, you know, um, box opening up to me, you know, like opening up Pandora's box. And I, I just loved it, you know. Mm-hmm. So I have to confess, though, okay, your motivation when you're younger is a lot different than your motivation when you're older. Because when I retired my hedge fund and basically thought I was going to retire, shut everything down, I mean, part of the reason was because I just didn't feel motivated anymore. I mean, I didn't need to make money. You know, I, I didn't need anything per se. And I really felt badly that I just didn't feel so motivated, you know, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden it's like there was this big world out there that I hadn't seen. I could I could go out and train horses and do this and that and all these different things that I had sort of let fall by the wayside. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to do these other things for a little bit because I'm not motivated to trade the market. And you know what? I got really bored after about five, six months. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh man, this really sucks. You know, I just can't do this for another 30 years, which was like, you know, all these other futsy things. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, let me, you know, I'm, I'm back to the screens and so forth. And um, I've come to make peace with the fact that you don't have to be in overdrive 100% of the time. You know, it's like that old um, analogy of 
biorhythms, you know, that everybody was keen on like 30 years ago. You know, we have mm. points in our cycle where our biorhythms are a little bit at a low trough, you know, and then we have points in the cycle where we're a little bit of a peak, you know, and, and life's like that. I kind of think of it as 10-year macro cycles. So I, I like to think of the fact that like, well, my motivation four years ago pretty much had hit a trough, you know, mm. and now it's all been ramping back up and accelerating back up to where I'm really excited to step back up my size, you know, more significantly. I, I told you I got an, an, a new assistant, you know, some, you know, and, and it's just because I finished this book. I got this book off my back and in the process of trying to write it, it was driving me crazy because the market, the market was so good, you know, so it's, you know, it's like chasing that sexy girlfriend. If you can't have her, all of a sudden you want it, right? You know, <laughs> And, and it was like that with trading. All of a sudden, I couldn't quite trade my full program because I was trying to finish up this damn book, you know? And all of yeah. a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God, I miss it so much. I love it so much. What am I just doing? These, like, little weenie size and all this stuff, you know? And I'm just sloppy and stuff, you know, because I just didn't have the time at night to do my full preparation. So that's a long-winded answer. But the the moral of the story is motivation can come and go and, and you know, depending on what else is going on in your life. And as long as you enjoy what you're doing, that's a pretty good motivator right there. Don't ever be motivated in this business by the money. Of course, the potential's there. But like any great business where you can make a buttload of money, it's because it's scalable, you know, and, and so that's what really makes this business rich. If you want to make a buttload of money is that it's scalable. Come up with your one thing, you know, or your one style or niche and eventually go into managing money and, you know, or become a, a profit center for a fund or something where you can do it on size and that's where you'll make your money. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think now um, you mentioned that you, you'd, you'd lack some motivation, you decided you were going to do all these other things and now you're getting back into trading. How has that, that difference in motivation actually impacted your trading? Well, keep in mind, I never stopped trading. I just was smart about it and cut back my leverage because I knew I wasn't giving it my full attention. But I always have a finger in the pie. Okay. I mean, I always got positions on in six or seven different markets. I'm just doing them on small size because the risk of me screwing up is like three times as great, you know. And and like I said, I, I've been preparing for the last three weeks just to really ramp it up again with the new year because the book – got delivered from the printer to the fulfillment center on Monday. I'm like, okay, I'm just waiting till I can hit that little button to, you know, uh, ship these orders that have come in and, and then we'll see what kind of life that takes on its own. You know, I'm, I'm not on Amazon or anything like that. So it was just more the, the thrill of producing it. You know, if I guess if I wanted to make serious money, I'd list it on Amazon or something, but they didn't do any work for the damn thing. <laughs> I did. So I'm like, okay, it's my book. <laughs> now, I just want to ask you something about um, working with others because um, from reading your book, you've had some people who've been kind of like mentors, perhaps mentorship kind of role. Um, you've obviously had people in your teams when you're um, doing your hedge fund. Um, how important is it uh, working with others and getting ideas that can impact your own trading? Well, you know, the the mentors I had were basically my bosses, you know, yeah. in the first couple years, you know, when I was on the exchange floor, that was in the 80s and stuff. Um, and, and then I, there's some really solid citizens and, you know, that I, I, I uh, traveled with and could pick their brains, people like Perry Kaufman. I just adore Perry. I think he's one of the best, uh, you know, researchers out there. And um, so I learned a lot. I really learned a lot, you know, in, in talking with him and, you know, s some similar people along those lines. As far as working with somebody, um, I like being the boss, you know, I don't want three cooks in the kitchen. So anybody mm -hmm. that's going to work around me, um, you know, 
they're there in a support function and keep your mouth shut, you know, <laughs> and I don't want to be that rude, but, you know, I just don't like to talk during the day. I really don't. So, but, you know, of course they're, they're best friends and you get along and you joke and you always laugh at lunch. Oh my goodness. There's so many hilarious stories. I think in that book of some of the stuff that happened in the office at lunchtime, it's like, ugh, you know, and, and, you have to have good chemistry, but I don't want other people's opinions, you know? And the wonderful mm -hmm. thing about the team that I had when I was running my hedge fund was they, you know, it's very easy for you to see when somebody else is making a mistake. And it's not so easy for you to see when you're making a mistake, mm -hmm. right? And so even when I was making a mistake or stepping out on a limb or assuming a little bit of risk there, they kept their mouth shut, you know, and, you know, didn't criticize or say otherwise. And that's actually what allowed for me to be able to make back losses so quickly as well, because I had that trade in my blood, in my skin, you know, and... I had my roadmap, and if I was a little bit early, you know, I had to trade around that or work around that. They're not going to, like, you know, be in my face about being a little bit early, you know, and nobody's perfect. You're always a little early or a little late, you know, but uh, it, it, it just seemed to work, and, um, you know, it doesn't happen instantly. I, I had a lot of people come and go, you know, um, a lot of different interns, a lot of different assistants, and, you know, as long as I... I always felt it important for somebody to feel that they were bettered after they left my office, that they were bettered for having worked with me. And not only that, that they were richer, you know, so the people that worked with me in my fund, I split the profits with them, you know, and mm -hmm. everybody was paid a percentage. Nobody was on salary. So, you know, we all had skin in the game, if you will. But they also knew that, you know, I was the captain of the ship. Okay, so how about now, how can people get a copy of this book? Oh, um, if you just go to my website, if you just Google my name, Linda Rashke, and go to my website, you'll see a little button there on the right side. The name of the book is Trading Sardines, and it's sort of a classic story. I'm sure, like, many people have heard it before about, uh, well, shoot, I'm not going to give it away. If you want to read yeah, the freaking story, yes. <laughs> no, you don't even have to buy the book. I posted, uh, you know, you can go on and click and read the first chapter for free and the trading sardine story and the apple, you know, the, the, see the whole outline and the chapters uh, yes. and stuff. Yeah. You don't have to buy the book. Of course it's in the first chapter, which you can go and see for free. So there you go. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll have a link, um, up on my website as well. If people, uh, can't find it on Linda's website, but it's lindarashke.net. Or lbrgroup.com, perhaps? I'm yeah, sure. you know what? I actually like kind that. of, um, LBR, it used to be LBR Group Inc. And then when the frickin' um, exchanges, like, raised the fees to a professional, you know, and I, <laughs> I mean, and I had me and my assistant and four different systems I paid data fees on. So all of mm. a sudden, my data fees were jumping up to $4,500 a month. I said, I don't think so. This is a message from God for me to retire because I'm not paying the exchange $4,500 a month and it fees for all these different things. I was, you know, programs I ran and software and this and that. And you throw in ice and you throw in Eurex and you do it for like two colleagues because you got to pay for their stuff separately. It's like, no, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's not L so I, so it's not LBR Group Inc. It's I don't know LBR Group LLC or something banal like that. But people will my, find my it. website, yeah, yeah. Just Google trading sardines or Linda Rashke, and you'll you'll yeah. be able to read it. Yeah. Now I want to finish up with a bit of a cliche question here, Linda. Um, <laughs> but I think once people read your book and they uh, they get to know your life story even more, it might be a little bit more ins insightful. Um, but the question is this. Um, if you had to start all over again, is there anything that you'd do differently? <laughs> yeah, I'd probably take a few more vacations. <laughs> 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 I mean, seriously, I I, um, I put myself under some like really ridiculous stress levels that I didn't yeah. realize how much damage it does to your body, and it really does like irreversible damage. So I would probably be a little bit more mindful not to do the stress level game again. All right. Well, um, thanks for your time today, Linda. It's been really um, great talking to you again. It's always 
insightful. Do, do you um, have any last words of advice you'd like to share before we finish up for today? No, no. I just wish everybody a fabulous 2019. Just take yes. one day at a time. That's my advice. One day at a time. Yeah. And find some balance, right? Oh, well, without saying. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but not while the volatility is good. You know, when, when the going's <laughs> good, stay with it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Linda. It's um, always a pleasure to talk to you. And I wish you the best for 2019 as well. Thank you, Andrew. Good night. Cheers. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.